Hello Internet! Once again we return to the saga of Tom Dooley and the murder that took place in Wilkes County in North Carolina 150 years ago. Daddy Sage will once again talk you through this day's events, so yeah, enjoy! Hello again, this is Daddy Sage. This time I will tell you what happened from Tom Dooley returned from prisoner of war camp in late summer 1865 until the trial against him began in October 1866. This knowledge is solely based on what can be read in the few remaining trial papers, including the arrest warrant, the indictment, about 20 surviving testimonies, the decision from Supreme Court after the appeals, and a few other papers. Also, a little bit of material found in contemporary newspapers. As usual, all drawings and paintings in this video are made by the late Mrs. Edith F. Carter. Mrs. Carter owned and ran the Whippoorwill Academy and Village in Ferguson until her death in 2014. The material is used with her permission. In late summer 1865, Tom returned from the prisoner of war camp. Soon after returning, he resumed the relationship with Anne Melton that he had had before the war. Most likely in the beginning of January, he started seeing Laura Foster, a distant cousin of Anne's who lived in German Hill, five miles away from Elkwood. Apparently, this relationship lasted only until around March 1st, when another distant cousin, Pauline Foster, came to visit Laura. A few days later, Pauline visited the Melton's home, looking for work. James Melton hired her as a field hand for the summer for a payment of $21. Pauline claimed that she had come to visit her grandfather, but in reality she had come to the area to see Dr. George Carter to get treatment for syphilis that she had contracted while back in Watauga County where she lived. On the first day at Anne and James's place she met Tom there, but she may already have met him during her visit to Laura Foster. All the time Pauline worked for Anne and James, Tom Dooley visited the house every day, most of the time he was together with Anne, but sometimes with Pauline. Even if she claimed that she did so only as a blind for Anne, other witnesses told a different story. On at least one occasion, Anne, Tom and Pauline shared a bed, and on one occasion Pauline spent the night in the woods with Tom and his friend George Washington, and they were not sleeping. In the beginning of April, Tom visited Dr. Carter, who found that he had contracted syphilis. According to the prosecution, Tom was sure that he had contracted it from Laura, but it can just as well have been from Pauline or someone else. Soon after, Tom had been diagnosed with syphilis, the same happened to Anne, and she made threats against Laura, who she thought was the reason for the disease. Also, James Melton was infected, and Anne told Pauline that she would sleep with James and make him believe that he had infected her. Pauline testified in court that Anne and James never had sex while she lived with them, and if that is true, James must have contracted the disease from someone else, but who? Maybe Pauline. Sometime in April, Pauline overheard an argument between Anne and Tom, in which Anne complained and scolded Tom for having a relationship with one Caroline Barnes. Most likely this Caroline was the 18-year-old daughter of wealthy farmer Mandy Barnes, who lived not far from Laura Foster's home. Also in April, a colored boy employed by Celia and James Scott met with Pauline at the road outside the Melton home. He brought her a message from Laura Foster. It must have been an oral message as both Laura and Pauline were illiterate. Nobody knows today what the message was about, but the event was important enough to be mentioned during trial. On Sunday, March 13, 1866, Tom visited his second cousin, Rufus Dula Hall, when he was on his way home from Sunday sermon. There was no churches in the area that time, so travelling ministers gave sermons in barns, large houses, or if the weather permitted, outdoors. He told Hall that he would put true, that is, kill in modern English, those who had given him the disease. It's worth noticing that Tom didn't mention any names and that he spoke in plural. Even so, the prosecution at the trial interpreted this to mean that Tom had threatened to kill Laura Foster. On May 20th, Tom visited Laura again. According to her father, it was two months after his latest visit. 
Wilson Foster was at home, and he told that Tom and Laura spoke for about an hour before Tom left. Already on Wednesday 23rd, Tom was back in Laura's home. This time Wilson Foster was out, but when he returned, he found Tom and Laura sitting close to each other in front of the fireplace. The earlier mentioned witness, Betsy Scott, testified in court that on the same Wednesday she saw Tom on foot about three miles from the Foster home. This statement is rather meaningless on its own as three miles from Laura's home indicates that Tom was closer to his own home than to Laura's, unless of course Betsy saw him in another direction. If this was the case, he may have visited a lot of other people, including Caroline Barnes or maybe his own second cousin, Sarah Louise Isbell, not to speak of Dr. Carter. On Thursday, 24th of May, Tom visited the Melton cabin in the morning before breakfast. Anne was not at home, but Tom told Pauline that he had met her on the ridge and that she has asked him to get some alum for her sore mouth due to the syphilis. According to another note in the trial papers, it was Tom himself that had a sore mouth, and Anne told him to get the alum at her cabin. When Tom got to the Melton cabin, he was accompanied by his second cousin, Carson Maguire Doula. Tom asked to borrow a canteen and told Carson to go home and fill it up with moonshine. I don't know for certain, but a lot happens before breakfast in this story. I believe that people normally rose around sunrise and worked for a couple of hours before eating breakfast around 8. After the visit, Tom headed for his own home. Along the way, he visited Lottie Foster, Anne's mother, and asked to borrow a mattock so he could improve the path between Lottie's cabin and his mother's. A witness later saw him working on the path, and several witnesses testified that the path actually had been improved in places. Sometime before noon, Carson Dooler returned to the Melton cabin with a liquor. After dinner, at that time dinner was the midday meal and you had supper in the evening. Anne left home and went to her mother's cabin bringing the canteen. Once there, she asked the little girl, maybe one of her younger sisters, to go to Tom's home and tell him to come and get the liquor. Only if his sister Eliza was there, she should not tell him but instead pull his sleeve or step on his toes. Nobody knows why Tom's sister could not know about the liquor. The little girl didn't find Tom in his mother's cabin though. Later, Tom came to Lottifotter's cabin anyway. He spoke with Laura, who was still there, and around 3 p.m. they both left Lottie's place and went in opposite directions, Tom heading for his home and Anne for hers. In the evening, Anne and her mother and Tom met somewhere in the hills near their homes where they spent the night drinking the liquor. The canteen was most likely a one-gallon canteen, so with quite an amount of liquor for three people. The same evening, a group of people gathered in the Melton cabin. Among these were James Melton, Pauline Foster, George Washington Anderson and Jonathan Gilbert, James Melton's day labourer. On the morning of Friday 25th, Wilson Foster woke up when he heard Laura leaving the cabin, but shortly after she returned and he believed she was opening a closet. Soon after he fell asleep again, and when he woke up a little before sunrise, sunrise was around 6.15am that day, Laura was gone. When he exited the cabin, he discovered that his horse was gone as well. The witness, Betsy Scott, explained in court that she met Laura between 5 and 6 in the morning near A.P. Scott's home on the road between German Hill and Elkville. She spoke shortly with Laura, who told her that she was going to Bates Place to meet with Mr. Dula. No first name was mentioned on that occasion. Betsy added in court that a few days earlier, Laura had told her that she planned to elope with Tom Dooley. Asked by Betsy, Laura told her that the reason Tom was not with her was that he had taken another path through the hills to avoid meeting manly barns. Around the same time as Laura left her home, Anne Melton returned to her home. Her shoes and the bottom of her dress were wet from dew. She took off her shoes, undressed and went to bed. When Wilson Foster discovered that the horse was gone, he followed its tracks. They were easy to follow as the day before he had been filing its hooves but didn't complete the task, so he left a visible tip on one of the hoofs, very recognisable on the tracks. He followed the tracks along the road to Bates Place, not meeting anyone along the way. At Bates Place he lost the track in an old overgrown field. He went to Celia and James Scott's place and had breakfast there, even if other people lived much closer to Bates Place than the Scots. Shortly after sunrise, 
maybe around 6.30, Cal Carlton, a relatively wealthy farmer, met Tom Dooley on a path leading between his farm buildings. He spoke shortly with Tom, who asked him if the path led to the Kendall home, which he confirmed, and Tom left again. A little before 8, Tom met Hezekiah Kendall. Kendall later testified that Tom came in the direction from Carlton's home and continued in the direction of Bates Place. He admitted, though, that the path led to many other places than Bates Place. Tom and he talked for a while, and Kendall asked if Tom has been after the girl, which Tom denied. No name was mentioned, and as Tom had many girlfriends, Kendall could be referring to any of these. After having had breakfast at the Scotch Place, Wilson Foster continued to the Melton home, closer to Bates Place than the Scott cabin. But anyway, he arrived a little after 8 and found Anne Melton in bed. He stayed for about 15 minutes. Shortly after Wilson had left, Tom Dooley arrived at the Scott home. The Carlton home, the Kendall home and the Scott home were all situated along the path that Tom was wa walking from the Foster home to the Reedy Branch settlement. Tom spoke a few minutes with Mrs. Scott and asked for her brother, George Washington Anderson. When he left, Mrs. Scott saw him continue in direction of the Melton home. Tom arrived at the Melton cabin a little after eight and shortly after Wilson Foster had left. He had a whispering conversation with Ed Melton still in bed. Paul noticed this when she returned from the field to milk the cows. After having milked just one of the cows, she came into the cabin again, but then Tom had left. When Wilson Foster left the Melton home, he looked up other people in the area asking them if they had seen his daughter or his horse. He spent most of the day doing so. From the Melton cabin, Tom went to Lottie Foster's home and asked for some milk. She provided him with half a gallon and he left again and she noticed that he walked in the direction of his own home. Sometime before dinner, that is still lunch, George Washington Anderson visited the Melton cabin and he found Anne in bed as well. He noticed that her shoes were wet. At dinner, Pauline returned from the field to the cabin and found Anne still in bed. She was also in bed when Pauline returned to the, to the field where she worked until 3 a.m. with James Melton and Jonathan Gilbert, the day laborer. They were busy planting corn. Also at noon, Mary Dula returned to her home from looking after the cows and found Tom lying on his bed. Tom did not leave his home in the afternoon. A witness, Jesse Gilbert, testified that he had met Mary Dula in the afternoon and that she claimed that she didn't know where Tom was. Mary Dula admitted having met Jesse and Carson Gilbert while out looking for her cows, but denied having said so. Rich farmer Rufus Dula Horton testified in court that Mary Dula was known to tell the truth, while Jesse Gilbert was known for lying and stealing. Mary Dula testified that Tom left the cabin in the evening or afternoon while she was cooking supper and stayed out for about an hour. He went to the barn, she told. <clears throat> Lottie Foster and her son Thomas claimed that they had seen Tom on the road that led to both Bates Place and the Melton home. When Thomas later visited his sister home, she was there, but Tom was not. Tom returned to his home in time for supper, and according to his mother, he never left the house again that night. She heard him sighing sometime during the night and went to his room looking after him as early as the same day he had complained of fever and chills. Maybe he was hung over from a night of drinking? After having given up on his search for his daughter and horse, Wilson Foster returned to the Melton cabin where he stayed for a couple of hours together with some other people. Anne Melton, who was still in her bed, her younger brother Thomas Foster, Pauline Foster, George Washington Anderson, Jonathan Gilbert and a relatively wealthy tenant farmer from the neighborhood by the name of William Holder. James Melton was not mentioned, but he may have been there as well, as well as other people. Probably under influence of a reasonable amount of liquor, they entertained themselves with practical jokes like Thomas Foster setting fire to Wilson Foster's sideburns. According to Pauline Foster, Wilson Foster declared that he didn't care about his daughter as long as he got his horse back, and Pauline Foster boasted that for a quart of liquor, she could get him his horse. Later in court, Wilson denied having said so, and Pauline claimed that she only said what she did in jest. When the entertainment was over, 
Wilson Foster walked to the home of James Melton's brother Francis about a quarter of a mile from Anne and James's home. This might indicate that Francis Melton was one of the party goers as well, but he was not explicitly mentioned as one. Pauline spent the night in bed with Anne's brother Thomas and at that time about around 17 years old. On the morning of Saturday 26th of May, Wilson Foster left Francis Melton's home. When he returned to his own cabin in German Hill, he found the horse outside. The rope it had been tied with seemed to be gnawed apart. Tom Dooley had breakfast at home, then went to the Melton home to pick up his fiddle that he had left there at an earlier occasion. He also wanted to have his shoes repaired. James Melton worked part-time as a cobbler. Tom spoke for about 30 minutes with Anne, then returned to his own home. He came back to the Meltons in the evening and entertained on the fiddle until bedtime. He spent the night at the Meltons' home. In the days after the murder, a proper search for Laura was launched. Around 80 people from German Hill, Granville, Elkville and other places took part in the search that lasted for about a week. After that, the search was downscaled and a lot fewer took part. In the following months, especially on Sundays, quite a few people still took part. Among these were Colonel James Isbell from Grandin and Walter Wiley Winkler from German Hill. The searchers returned no result and after a while they became more sporadic and if even fewer people took place. On Sunday the 24th of June another search was carried out. In this search quite a lot of people participated. The search started near the Dula place where the men were lined up in a single row with a short distance between them. They then walked slowly forward across the ridge to Bates Place. At the edge of Bates Place, the remains of a rope was found tied around a dogwood tree. Wilson Foster did not participate in this search, but later he identified the rope as one he saw the horse had been tied with. He knew it as he had made the rope himself and knew his own handiwork. In the evening of the day the rope was found, Tom once more visited the Melton home and James Melton told him that some Hendrixes were accusing him of having murdered Laura. Which Hendrixes was not mentioned, but there were a lot of them around. Even Tom's older sister Anna was married to Mikaja Hendrix. A couple of days later, another search was carried out in the area where the rope was found. Not far from there, the search party found a place where a horse had been tied. The twigs had been nibbled and the horse had donked twice. A bit from the trees, a dark spot was found on the earth, which smelled bad. This led the people to believe it was blood and that Laura has been killed there, even if they actually didn't know if she was dead at all. Later, the horse had been moved to the place where the rope was found. On Monday 25th, Tom visited the Hendrixes in question to give them a good licking but in the evening he returned to the Melton home in a depressed mood. Tom spent the night in the Melton home, sharing a bed with Anne. He denied having anything to do with the murder and that the Hendrixes were telling lies about him. During the night, Pauline heard that both Anne and Tom were crying. They left the cabin and Pauline followed them out. Outside, Tom told Anne and Pauline that he would leave Elkville, but would be back at Christmas time to fetch Anne and his mother. Neither James Melton nor Tom's sister Eliza were mentioned at that occasion. The next morning Tom left the area on foot. It was later proven that he had walked through Watauga County, probably following an old buffalo trail to Trade, Tennessee. He spent some time in Watauga County, but we don't know how long. The distance he walked was a little over 30 miles through rugged terrain with only a few roads and not too good path so the walk must have taken in some time. On the 28th of June, Wilson Foster visited the local Justice of Peace and accused some people of having dealt foully with Laura. An arrest warrant was issued on Thomas Dooler, Anne Pauline Melton, Anne Pauline Dooler and Granville Dooler. The two last mentioned was Tom's first cousins and why they were mentioned in the warrant is not known today. The next day, Anne Melton, Anne Dula and Granville Dula were arrested and interrogated by the Justice of Peace, who found them innocent and set them free again. On the 4th or 5th July, Tom arrived in Trade, Tennessee. He got a job on a farm owned by James Grayson, a former colonel in the Union Army, 
now a member of the Tennessee legislation. Tom told him that his name was Tom Hall and that he only wanted the job to earn money to buy a new pair of boots. On July 9th, Tom left Colonel Grayson's farm and continued his travel in direction of Mountain City, Tennessee, after having bought new boots in trade. Later that day, a couple of sworn deputies from Wills County, Ben Ferguson and John Jack Atkins, arrived at the farm asking for Tom. Next day, Colonel Grayson followed the two deputies in their hunt for Tom. They found him in the very small village Pandora, where he was cooling his blistered feet in Doe Creek. Colonel Grayson had brought his gun, but it wasn't necessary to use it as Tom surrendered without resistance. He was taken back to Colonel Grayson's farm, where he spent the night tied up in the barn. Next morning, the two deputies, accompanied by Colonel Grayson, brought Tom back to Wilkes County, where he was turned over to Sheriff Hicks and incarcerated in Wilkes County Jail. Five days later, Pauline Foster and her brother returned to their home in Watauga County. While they were there, Pauline traveled to Tennessee for reasons unknown today. Around July 25th, Anne Melton and her brother Sam traveled to Watauga County and convinced Pauline to return to Elkville. Around August 10th, according to Pauline's testimony, Anne took her to Laura's grave. Pauline followed her to stop before they reached the actual gravesite. Along the way, Anne talked about the searches for Laura and how they had almost stopped. She wanted to see if the grave had been disturbed, and if it had, she would dig up the body and bury it in the cabbage patch, or cut it into pieces and feed it to the pigs. Around August 17, Pauline, in a state of intoxication, told Bern Ferguson and Jack Atkins that she and Tom Dooley killed Laura Foster. Later, she claimed that it was just a drunken jest because Ferguson has accused her of killing Laura and escaping to Watauga. Three days later, Anne and Pauline had a violent altercation during a visit to Celia Scott's home. Both girls were accusing each other of knowing something about the murder and Anne beat Pauline with a club and tried to strangle her. After the fight, they left the place and Anne returned alone and threatened to kill Celia Scott if she told anyone what she had witnessed. On August 28th, Pauline was arrested as an accomplice in the murder of Laura Foster and was incarcerated next to Tom in the Wills County Jail. Pauline turned state witness and promised to show a search party where Laura's body was buried. She was escorted back to Elkville and guided the search party to the place where she had stopped when Anne was taking her to the grave. The search party split in pairs and each pair searched a designated area. One of the pairs consisted of Colonel James Isbell and his father-in-law, 75-year-old Major David Horton. The latter was on horseback. At one time the horse snorted like it had smelled something and when Isbell probed the ground they discovered the grave. Dr. Carter was called and noticed a stab wound in the breast of the body. It was very decomposed and the flesh has disappeared from the face so Laura was only identified by her clothes and a gap between her front teeth. Laura's body was taken to what was then known as Cowles Door in Elkville, even if Calvin Cowles hadn't owned it for eight years. Here the body was examined, but Dr. Carter couldn't determine if the knife had hit the heart. After the examination, Laura's body was taken back to German Hill and buried on land that belonged to Walter Winkler. Pauline was released and instead Anne Melton was arrested and incarcerated in Wilkes County Jail in the cell next to Tom, awaiting trial. Time, Tom had been in jail for more than a month and a half without anyone knowing if a crime had actually been committed. So much from the story up to the trials. The trials and the time after that will be the theme of my next video. Until then, look all out for yourself and do not get caught. That was it. I hope you enjoyed that. It's always fun to hear Daddy Sage explain a completely irrelevant murder trial 150 years old. And I know you all enjoy being informed about this monumental uh, case and achievement in historical research. So we shall return to this as soon as Daddy Sage returned from his exodus to Brussels next month. Until then... I have been the Sage, and I wish you all a very happy day.